My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Don Hagee at Vidon Vineyard in Newburgh. It is August 3rd, 2016. And Don, our first question for you is why wine? Well, it all began when I was a student in Berkeley. Um, I used to visit Napa Valley uh, frequently when there were five wineries. Uh, <laughs> that was after I came back from Korea and spent a year at the Naval Air Station. I flew with the Navy. Uh, so I was over 21, but I used to spend weekends regularly in Napa, and there were, uh, as I said, a small number of wineries. Robert and Peter Mandavi were uh, just part of the family and not well known. Uh, there was Inglenook Christian Brothers and Beaulieu, and uh, that's when I, I sort of became hooked on wine. Uh, that went on until I did postgrad work in France, and uh, I discovered Burgundy, mm. and so wine stuck with me. Uh, all through my life. And now bef between that, before coming into wine, you worked at NASA, right? Yes, well I started, uh, I grew up on a farm, so that, that part was uh, hardwired, so to speak. Uh, I like machinery and soil and plants. Uh, then after the military and grad school I, uh, and postgrad in France, I went to work for NASA for seven years and then to Silicon Valley in California. Uh, and of course continued visiting the wine country until I came here as the CEO of a semiconductor company in 1995. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I biked quite frequently on the weekends here and just fell in love with, uh, with this area and decided it's time to make a change in 99. I, uh, I bought this 20 acre piece of property and started clearing the rocks and stumps and uh, poison oak and blackberries and started planting in 2000. So before we get on to wine, I have since we, we don't talk to a lot of NASA scientists in this job, I would love to hear just any of your kind of memorable moments from that part of your career. Well, it was a very exciting time. I had um, never thought I would live in Texas. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, what brought me to NASA was I, I did uh, in grad school, elementary particle physics, uh, I went to France and spent a year doing it there on their machines. But I became somewhat disenchanted and one of the uh, professors in Berkeley who later got the Nobel Prize suggested I go into NASA uh, because he believed we would be doing the best high energy physics in space, in space stations and laboratories. So I applied at that time, they were seeking scientist astronauts, and being a pilot and a scientist, I applied. I didn't get into the flight program, but uh, I did go in initially to do research at the Goddard Space Flight Center near Washington on uh, satellites, and I developed instrumentation to measure um, galactic and uh, solar cosmic radiation using the Explorer satellite series. Uh, that was from 64 through 67. And then in 67, when they had the accident on the pad at uh, Cape Canaveral, mm -hmm. as it was then named, uh, Apollo 1 burned the crew, they reorganized uh, in Houston. And the deputy director was one of the persons who had been a mentor of mine in Berkeley, Dr. Hess. And he called me and said, come on Don, we're looking at creating a physics branch. I did. and. Uh, I forgot about Texas and took the job and <laughs> loved it. And so I was there all through the, the uh, missions through Apollo 13. Wow. Uh, well, it was all exciting. Every time there was a landing, uh, we were watching closely, of course, sure. and celebrating afterwards uh, with the culmination being uh, Neil and Buzz on the moon on July 20th and I think it was 69. 69, right. Yeah. A very exciting era. That's really neat. So then from there you went into Silicon Valley. <clears throat> yes, I, I went back uh, to, uh, to the Bay Area. Uh, I had worked closely with one of the professors from Berkeley who then had the Nobel Prize in doing research in space uh, while I was in Houston, uh, Professor Alvarez. It turned out he was on the board of directors of, of Hewlett Packard. Uh, he was the first person to use the uh, instruments that Bill Hewlett built in his garage in Palo Alto. And uh, so Louis Alvarez said, let's go see Bill. I was uh, disenchanted with NASA. It was becoming very political. Uh, we had accomplished our mission and uh, uh, the GSA and other bureaucracy crept in. 
Sure. And I wanted to get back out. And anyway, we went. I went back and met with Bill Hewlett and other people, and ended up uh, uh, in a small company uh, in Silicon Valley in 1970. Um, I learned quite a lot. It was a different game from uh, dealing with the government and going into private industry where it's, it's very cutthroat sure. and uh, uh, it was exciting and uh, I continued on in high tech until I ended up here. So that's, those are some interesting tra career transitions, like you say, from government to private industry, right. from private industry to owning your own winery. Yeah. Yes. So tell me about some of the kind of successes and issues you had making, especially the transition from private industry and into wine. Well, what comes to mind uh, when I think about the transition, uh, one thing in the government, I spent a fair amount of time, uh, uh, you know, giving presentations and, and uh, raising money, uh, competing with other parts of the uh, of the directorate to get money to do my experiments. But on the outside, it was working with venture capitalists to get money to get a company going. Sure. And uh, it wasn't there was no P and L in the government, but on the private side it's all about the bottom line eventually um, so it was it was uh, quite a transition uh, uh, and uh, I learned a lot uh, got fired a couple times of course that's the real world out there sure. in venture capital um, so I, I went off and founded my own companies eventually uh, two small companies uh, they were quite successful and uh, uh, I learned a great deal of course along the way uh, so then you came into this business uh, at an age, you know, when many people are retiring. So what made you want to take on that challenge? Well, I don't believe in retirement. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's preparing to go on and uh, I just think you need to be active and uh, I think you'll, I think one will live longer. I saw what happened to my father when he had to retire and had nothing to do. So that will never happen to me. So at 69, I bought the land and started, uh, you know, clearing it, renting equipment and eventually bought my own tractor and, and uh, learned how to make wine and uh, every day there's something new and I'm but right now trying to figure out how to make better wine and uh, I might have to bring in an experienced um, old trained winemaker to help me. <laughs> sometimes that's good and sometimes I'm not happy with it. Um, so you talk about learning how to make wine. How, yeah. how did you go about learning well, how to make wine? Well, I, I, when I bought the land, I, I enrolled in Chemeketa in the viticulture program. There were four quarters during the winter part-time uh, to learn about the uh, farming part. And of course, I knew about the machinery, having grown up on a farm. But uh, uh, when I started making the wine, I worked with Laurent Montelieu at Northwest Two Crushes in McMinnville. And uh, I think it was 2000 two and three and uh, and then I bought several books and uh, it's a very friendly uh, and helpful environment. Uh, I'll never forget when I bought the land uh, I think about a week afterwards I had a call from David Adelsheim welcoming me and asking <laughs> what he could do to help me. Wow that's uh, really cool. Yeah. But that's the nature of this environment uh, in Oregon mostly uh, still maybe changing but it's still that way now and i understand you build your own equipment here to use or some of your own equipment here for the winery. well a little bit uh, you know being a farmer uh, you learn how to do a lot of things with your hands so i'm always trying to figure out ways to do things better and more efficiently uh, you know and so i i, I build uh, i don't like to waste wine i have a system here for example to dispense the wine when you open a bottle and pour it, it gets air and it doesn't last long. So I, I have a system where I think I have 10 bottles lined up. The wine is pushed out with nitrogen. Uh, as you see in an, one of these nice bars, they have these systems, but I built it. Uh, saves a lot of wine and you don't, you don't pour bad wine. I built systems for uh, bottling to use, uh, I, don't, I don't use corks. I don't like what corks do to much of the wine. I use glass stoppers and screw caps. I built systems to apply the stoppers and the uh, heat shrink. That's a screw cap. And whatever I can, I, I built a lot of stuff out for the, you know, for the land to with machinery and so on. 
but farm boys, that's what you learn when you grow up on a farm. Did, did you find it came pretty naturally to you, grow, grow, learning how to grow the grapes and learning how to be back in the farm again after so many years? Did I what? It was a pretty natural to you to get back uh, into the farm? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, tractors are natural. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up driving a tractor when I was five or six, I think, a little bit. So what is Vidon Vineyard known for? Well, as far as the wine, uh, uh, I, I do something that's somewhat unique. The main wine I have is labeled three clones. And that's because there are three clones in the original block I planted. And you, you know what clones are. The, 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 that's what we call the various genetic mutations of the Pinot Noir vine. Sure. Uh, I have 115777 in Pomard. Uh, the 5.2 acres is divided equally among those three. And, and this wine is one third each. So it's three clones. But I keep the, some of the single clones. Uh, for in barrels for an additional seven months where these these wines get 11 months the single clones get 18 months we also happen to have three grandchildren so their names are on the single clones uh, the uh, uh, 777 is Brigitte for example but those wines get additional so when people come I can pour the three clones and the single clone so it's a it's a uh, demonstration of blending uh, that's one thing I do. The other thing I do often is pour a vertical of three or four vintages so you can see how every year is different. Because my style of winemaking is, uh, I say, minimal intervention. I do as little as I have to. <laughs> I don't use enzymes or additives or, or factory yeast. It's all indigenous. And therefore, the, uh, the wines really reflect the year. Every year is different. Whereas in a bigger winery, oftentimes they will try to adjust the wines to maintain some consistency from year to year with their brand where small guys don't do that. So I think what's unique is you can do verticals here often and the horizontal as I say you can get this individual clones which blended make the three clones. Which is your, do you have a, a favorite wine or a one that you're most proud of? Well, uh, the best wine I ever made was 2004, <laughs> but I don't have any left. <laughs> it was the most Burgundian. Uh, since then, I prefer the lighter styles. Uh, the uh, 2012 is the wine which the Wine Spectator liked best and gave the highest numbers to. Nice. Uh, that's not my favorite style. Uh, I prefer the 10 or 11 and the 13s, which are more in the direction of Burgundy. And I'm trying to learn how to make wines more like that, but that's why I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into the industry uh, right around 2000, and yes. so you've seen the you've seen the number of wineries more than triple in your yes, roughly yeah. 15 years in the industry. So what has it been like watching the industry grow so fast? Well, uh, it's become more difficult to sell the wine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because there are. Uh, Although the number of people has grown in the area, the number of wineries has uh, more than tripled since I bought the land. And uh, so, it, you know, there are more places to go. Uh, that's the main thing I feel right now. Uh, but I think it's good for the area. I like, I like what's happening to Newburgh and McMinnville with the great restaurants and uh, everything around here. Uh, the Allison is a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the great restaurants. Sure, sure. And Portland is a booming little city. Much different from what I discovered when I came here back in, uh, I think it was in the late 70s, to look at investing in real estate. And it, it wasn't a very interesting place. <laughs> uh, so how, how have you... Um, What's it been like adapting to the sort of the changes in the industry, the te technological changes and, and the new advancements and things that are being done now? Uh, well, uh, again, I go back to selling the wine. Uh, when I started, when you do two, three, four hundred cases, it's quite easy to sell. I, you know, I had a, a card table in the corner in a homemade bar here, <laughs> and uh, uh, I started putting signs up and... Uh, People came by. And then I self-distributed for a while. Uh, I used to run around and uh, 
uh, I had seven Fred Meyers, many wine shops. I soon discovered it wasn't terribly profitable because, uh, you know, you discount it heavily and you spend all your time doing that. But if you put a sign down on the main road and someone drops up, comes by and buys a case or two at retail, you're ahead of the game. So I kind of changed the model. As part of the earlier um, a sales program, I used to distribute in California myself. I'd, because my children are there, my old friends are there, I'd load up my van and take 40 cases down, and I had many good wine shops, but that doesn't pay either. Mm. Um, so then I started the wine club, but what, what I find about clubs is people somewhat object to the commitment, and, and from the wineries point of view, there's a lot of maintenance because of credit cards changing and addresses changing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a staff. I didn't like to be on the phone. Um, but what I did do is I started a different kind of club and I built it up to about 800 people. Uh, and I used to have big crowds here. Um, and uh, I don't think crowds are conducive to uh, what I think is a nice environment to talk about wine. I like when three, four, or half a dozen people are around, we can really talk about wine, go look at the vineyard, equipment. But when you have 60 people here, it's, it's a rat race. Sure. Uh, so I, I just uh, stopped my club and decided to go to a different model, uh, which I'm using now, and that's a reward model. Instead of, instead of uh, a club where you make a commitment and get shipments regularly based on what you select, you buy any wine you want any time, and you earn rewards based on what you buy, and you have an account online which uh, I developed the software for. <laughs> so you can look and see what you have and, uh, and what you have to buy. And, and I'm expanding that program and it's working pretty well. Uh, and that's part of what's happening, I think, it's because of what's happening in the environment. It's very hard to sell the wine. A lot of people have clubs, but many people are tired of them too. Uh, I'm trying to find some other easy way to sell wine where I still don't have to deal with the masses. <laughs> <laughs> and so is that the, the Vin Alliance? Is that what you're talking about with your new uh, club? The Vin Alliance is, yeah, I'm, I'm moving towards that. Um, <clears throat> what I have in mind there is something more ambitious. Um, I, I'm changing my model a bit, but essentially anyone who spends $500 worth of uh, buys $500 worth of wine with me in a year will be at level one discount and they'll get a 15% discount on anything they get. As long as in the last year they've spent $500. They can buy one bottle or 10. If they spend a thousand, the discount goes up to 20% and so on. And that software is built in. <laughs> but what I want to do in the Van Oleans is make that uh, true in any winery that becomes a member of the Alliance. So if there's a 10 or 100 wineries in there sure. and, and you are a member or bought the hundred dollars and became a member in mine, you're a member of the Alliance, so you take your card or your membership and go to any other wine, you get the same benefits. But what we will give to the wineries who become part of the Alliance is the software. Hmm. So they get the system, which is a, a point of sale system, uh, an inventory management system, and a customer management system. And in return, we take a small percentage of their net sales. Uh, but it helps, it's, it's a social networking kind of thing. Sure. Because as a member, you could go online and uh, buy wine from one of the wineries you uh, are a member of, from any, any winery in the Alliance, or you could say, I want to find a Petite Syrah that's under $40, so you can do a search, hmm. and it'll look through all those wineries and say, ah, oh, here it is, let me order that. Clever. That's a nice, that's a cool idea. So uh, anyway, people are, are uh, I don't have the commitment to the club, but they have the flexibility of buying any wine they want from any. And, and the wineries in the Alliance are exposed to all of the other members of every winery. Sure. So how has that been going? Have you been finding people interested in the industry? Yeah, I've, I've talked to several wineries and they're interested. I, I don't have the software ready yet. I'm hoping to release it this fall if I get time. But I'm <laughs> testing it on two or three small wineries. Cool. And so that's very cool. And I understand you also want to put in a helipad here for hel for helicopter well, tours. I have a, a customer who comes all the time in his helicopter, and he wants to put a pad up here. <laughs> so I say, sure, I might do that. <laughs> I don't think I could officially do it because it would be too bureaucratic. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So how do you find yourself sort of one man show? How do you find yourself 
how does your your day break down? How does your year break down? How much time do you spend in the winery, in the tasting room, in the vineyard? Oh, uh, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I take off once in a while. No, I have. I just hired in March a very very good person, uh, good experience, excellent with people who runs the tasting room for me most of the time. Okay, he's off right now, and occasionally I have other people who come and help. Uh, when we on busy weekends and it hasn't been great this year but it's starting to pick up mm -hmm. uh, but um, I still take off uh, I spent a month in Africa two years ago on a safari with some guys <laughs> so I get away nice. but when I'm here uh, you know I'm, I'm pretty busy I can imagine you're pretty busy yeah. There's a, lot, a lot going on here yeah um, so where do you see Vidon vineyards going in the future it's a good question uh, what happens if I go away? Uh, well, my children aren't interested. It's not their game. It's too much work. Small vineyard operation like this is, it's work. Mm -hmm. You can make a living, but it's not one where you earn a lot of money. And, and, um, I, I think it'll probably just be sold. I might, I might look at trying to find a good partner to come in now mm -hmm. and then transition. Because I, I won't be able to continue forever, you know, at my age. <laughs> Do you have so you'd like to see you'd like to see the label live on? Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to build a new winery edition. I have the plans uh, for a fermentation room and barrel room back in the hill to complete the development of this property, which was my vision when I uh, first saw it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have money, so I, I need to bring in a partner. <laughs> <laughs> So never, never bored. You're never bored around here. I can tell. You no, always have something you're thinking about. I think I, I don't believe in them being bored. <laughs> no, there's always something to do. You know, well, people stand here and look at it and say, "Oh, it's so pretty," and I say, "Yeah." <laughs> but you know, I look over there. I see the work that I should be. Doing. <laughs> uh, so, you've seen that. What we talked about earlier. Have you seen? You've seen the industry grow quite a bit in the last 15 years. Yeah. Where do you see it going in the next 15 or 20 years? Well. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you a good answer, but I, I, you see many of the outside California wineries buying other wineries and so on. That'll probably continue, but before long there won't be much more land that's really ideal for vineyards available. I mean, it's getting scarce now. Mm -hmm. um, I think Oregon will, will probably remain this way for some time because uh, the big wineries, Gallo is not interested in it. Jackson family is different. They, they bought these small wineries, but I think they're they're continuing to be quite independent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have great hope that Oregon will continue as it is, uh, and they'll solve their traffic problems in the next 20 years, <laughs> and it'll be a great place to visit. And it won't be as commercial as Napa. Uh, I saw that go from five wineries to mm -hmm. where it is now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I'm optimistic. The land use. Uh, here has been pretty good. We kept the big hotels off the vineyard property. Uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic about the future here. You have experience with California's wine region, obviously, and, and, a, and a little with France as well. Yeah. How can you, how does Oregon compare to, the, to those two? Well, I, I can't say I've had any experience there except to visit many years ago. Sure. And, and uh, when I was in California, that's 20 some years ago too. Uh, I think we compare to some areas like Paso Robles, Moore and Sonoma County, there are smaller wineries. Napa is a different game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's similar. There are many good small family wineries in the, in the uh, Hillsburg area that I like a lot. Uh, what advice would you give someone who was looking to enter the wine industry, the Oregon wine industry? Well, plan to work very hard, and uh, uh, if you know you can do anything you want if you uh, approach it the right way. You set the bar high and, and work hard, and uh, uh, one step at a time. Uh, <laughs> I forgot the name of the poet, but when I was studying French, I'll never forget because he he did he had a beautiful poem about building a house one brick at a time, and it came out to be a beautiful place and. It's the way, one step at a time, every day that you do something. But it's not easy, but it can be done. Um, 
I admire many of the people around here I've seen build their little wineries and vineyards. Uh, that's all the plan questions I have for you. Does anybody? The bee. The bee? And the brand. Oh. I want to know about the bee. The bee. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to ask you about the bee on the on the, oh, on the, on the caps. Yeah. Yes. Well, along the driveway as you came up, when we bought the property in 99, there was a well house, uh, which had between the studs on one side many honeybees. And the, the old lady who lived in the double wide trailer down here, um, said there's a lot of honey there it runs out of the wall <laughs> but anyway we built the house and moved in in 2003 and uh, sitting on the deck one evening we heard a lot of buzzing and found under the deck that the electrician had left the hole uh, for electrical conduit the bees had swarmed and moved in uh. at the time we were planning the label and uh, vicky said uh, gee let's put the bee on the label she likes bees and it's a French wine, and <laughs> Napoleon liked bees, and he liked wine, so we put it on a label. <laughs> that's, that is a, that's a great reason I like that. That's, that's excellent. The story about Vidon, by the way, uh, it's a French name, and I've had emails a couple different times in French asking if we are related. But the real story is back in 2000, I tried to get Vidon.com as my website, and it couldn't because it's owned by a small uh, intellectual property law firm in northern France. Uh, and, and when you Google, of course, we have Vidon Vineyard, but if you Google, you get Vidon. And I saw this guy grew from having had one office to five more, <laughs> including Singapore, Shanghai. And, and I thought, you know, he's on the ball. It would be kind of fun to send him a bottle of wine with his name. Sure. And, and that was about six years ago. I didn't get to it, but I had an email from Patrice Vidon. He knew about the wine and asked about the name. We established the dialogue. I shipped him a six-pack of wine, and he wrote, uh, if you get to France, we'd love to have you visit. We have plenty of room in our chateau. It was built in 1680, <laughs> and I think we answered in 10 minutes. And, <laughs> and we spent six days with Patrice four years ago. He's up on the... Uh, on the north, in the north part of Brittany, Bataan, right near Normandy, near the English Channel, wow. near Saint Malo, and and you can see the Chateau Saint Michel from his chateau, you know, the big wow. island. <laughs> That's an incredible story. That's incredible. But he hasn't been out to see you yet. No, we're waiting for him. He <laughs> claims he's coming, but he's busy <laughs> traveling to uh, the Far East. I think <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Well. Uh, <coughs> That's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that I should have asked? Anything else you'd like to add? No, I can't, I can't think of anything. I probably said too much. <laughs> no, you're perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much.